Hello, everyone. Welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the Science Coordinator for the Partnership. Our webinar today is hosted by one of the teams that works within the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. We have critical management question teams, and the team hosting this webinar is the CMQ number four team. This team is really focused on the physiological impacts of climate change on species, um, and in this case, vegetation communities. And um, understanding those impacts and what they may be into the future, as well as thinking about uh, what potential adaptation actions might be for the management and conservation communities. So today, um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Peter Fule. He's a professor at the School of Forestry in the College of Forestry, Engineering, and Natural Sciences at Northern Arizona University. He's going to be presenting today on how will climate change and management treatments affect southwestern forests over the 21st century. Dr. Fule studies the interactions between forests, fires, and climate, and he uses historical ecology techniques, including dendrochronology, which is tree ring analysis, to study these interactions during past centuries. He uses experimental studies in forest restoration to test methods of restoring resilient forest ecosystems and simulation models of vegetation change under alternative climate change scenarios and management activities. These are applied to forecast future forest development and test strategies for forest conservation. Dr. Fule does research in the US, Latin America, and the Mediterranean region. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Peter. Please go ahead. Thank you for all being right. with Thank us today. You. Thank you very much, Amy. And thanks to all of you for joining the webinar. Um, the title of this webinar is quite broad and maybe ambitious. I can't say how climate change and management treatments will affect southwestern forests over the 21st century. I don't think anyone can. But the idea of what I'm going to try to present today is to discuss management treatments that we use in forests that are vulnerable to severe wildfires, to other large disturbances, and to climate change, and to discuss a particular tool, the Climate Forest Vegetation Simulator Model, developed by the Forest Service and used by um, researchers and managers across the western U.S. and in some places around the world, to try and project a range of potential future outcomes depending on different climate scenarios and different management treatments. On the title screen, you see the names of a number of people. I particularly want to mention Alicia Aspeleta and Kristen Shive, who are um, people who completed master's degree projects at NAU using these models. And at the end of the presentation is a link to their publications. I'm describing today mostly the work by Alicia Aspeleta um, which was published in uh, Ecological Applications this past year. And you also see our affiliations um, with Northern Arizona University, the Forest Service, and a university in Spain. Okay. Sorry, I was hung up for a moment. It wouldn't advance the slide. So as Amy mentioned in the introduction, the Desert LCC is organized around critical management questions. And the, this particular webinar falls into the questions shown here on the screen where this group is asking what species will be impacted by physiological stress due to climate change and to what extent. The particular species that I'm going to be talking about today are ponderosa pine, gamble oak, um, alligator juniper and other junipers, and pinon, Pinus edulis, in the highlands of eastern Arizona on the Mogollon Rim. And then the group also asks what adaptation strategies might be applied to lessen the impact. And here we're talking about management treatments, including tree cutting and fire use. These are widespread, widely used treatments. The um, difference in the project that we undertook with the climate forest vegetation simulator model was to try to apply this management tool for assessing these options over the long term, over the next century, under different climate scenarios. And I'll talk about the, the fire situation, the forest situation, and the modeling situation as we move into the next slides. 
So first off, with forests and fire in the southwestern U.S., we have dry coniferous forests that cover about 25 million acres of the highlands in Arizona and New Mexico. These forests, uh, that's, a, that's a really small fraction of the whole landscape. And so uh, in the desert landscape um, LCC, for example, it makes sense to use the term desert, but those highlands are disproportionately important. They're extremely important as watersheds. Um, they're important for recreation, for wood products, for wildlife, and for biological diversity in these regions. We have two convergent trends that create severe fires in the southwest and throughout much of western North America. These trends are a fuel increase due to land use change. The type of land use change that we're talking about is the exclusion of fires that used to burn, um, lit by lightning and by humans over many thousands of years, over the entire Holocene period since the last ice age. Um, these dry coniferous forests had frequent surface fire regimes, but the interruption of those fire regimes and the development of more dense forests dominated by younger trees has led to an increase in fuels that supports more severe fires. And the second trend is of warming temperatures, which mean drier fuels, longer fire seasons, and higher fire severity. And those conditions are projected to increase in the future. These, I'm calling these trends convergent because they both move systems in the same direction. They increase their vulnerability to severe fires. So. An example is shown on the screen here in the lower right. This is the Rodeo Chetuskai Fire in Arizona, the first wildfire in the southwestern United States to hit the approximately half million acre threshold. And just um, nine years later in 2011, the Wallow Fire became um, even larger than the Rodeo Chetuskai. And to put those numbers in perspective, um, a national forest, an entire national forest, is often on the scale of something like a million to a million and a half acres. So it's an extraordinary amount of area to cover, much of it, not all of it, but much of it with severe burning. Um, fuel treatments such as tree thinning, prescribed burning, have been shown to reduce fire severity. And in the case of the Rodeo Chetuskai fire in particular, in a study that uh, Barbara Strom and I carried out in 2007, we showed that fuel treatments affected the forest for at least 100 years. In other words, places that had been treated with thinning and prescribed burning prior to the Rodeo Chetuskai fire, there was a persistent effect for a century of difference in terms of the forest composition and the forest structure, with the original Ponderosa pine forest being the the dominant species throughout in the treated areas, and a mixture of more shrubby species and drier, more woodland species such as oak, pinon, and juniper dominating the sites that had not been treated before the Rodeo Chetuskai fire. But this analysis that, um, that we did several years ago now, published in 2007, did not incorporate climate change in any way. So it was looking at the post-fire trajectory without taking climate change into account. However, we need to take climate change into account. And there is evidence from all sorts of sources related to climate change and fire. I'm just going to show a few graphics here. On the left-hand side, you see weather stations across the western United States and into Canada where red indicates that temperatures have become warmer in the last half of the 20th century. Blue, of which there are very few, indicates cooling temperatures, and the size of the dots is related to the degrees and degrees Celsius of change. And you can see that the map is almost entirely red, and there are many quite large dots which indicate three or four degrees Celsius change at those weather stations over the last half of the 20th century. So this is not a future projection. This is evidence of existing temperature increase in the last um, several decades, last half of the 20th century. The middle panel and the right-hand panel come from work by Tony Westerling and others who looked at the relationship between climate, climate change, observed climate change, and forest fires. And in the right-hand panel, there is a trace in the right-hand panel on the top where it says A. There's a trace of temperature since 1970. And you see that the temperature goes up and down, but it has a general trend upwards. The red bars are 
the area burned in wildfires, and you can see that there are peaks and troughs that correspond to the temperature changes. So we see a relationship between fire across a, a vast area of the western United States and temperature. And we see that temperature across that region in the last um, four decades or so has been on an increasing trend. On the bottom panel there, panel B, they were looking at changes in the fire season and suggesting that one of the effects of these warming conditions is to dry out fuels and to extend fire seasons to make them start earlier in the spring and finish later in the fall. And in the middle panel is a forest vulnerability index that they created to try to represent the, the combination of dry fuels and longer fire seasons on the vulnerability of forests. You can see actually that for us in the southwest, even though we have been um, facing some extraordinary fires in recent years and we, we live in a hot, dry area, possibly we are not in the worst situation when you look at the, the temperature and the forest vulner vulnerability maps. Now, if we turn from the past toward the future, this is from a publication by Richard Seeger and others from 2007, and many people in the Southwest have made use of this modeling. What is being shown on this graph is a, it says filtered P minus E anomaly, so precipitation minus evaporation, essentially the moisture coming in minus the moisture going out. When the graph, when the trace in the graph is at zero, that means that it's the same as the historical or the past um, relationship between precipitation and evaporation. When the anomaly moves into the negative terrain, as it does on the right-hand side of the graph, then that means that we are looking at increasingly dry conditions. And basically what they were showing with the, the range of lines and the thick pink band in this graphic is that they're using multiple models to try to look into the future because there is not one perfect um, future climate model, but by looking at models developed by groups of climatologists from different labs all around the world, they can see whether or not there is a consistency in terms of these projections. They also initialized their modeling in 1900, so they were able to model forward with over a century of actual data to test the model performance and then allow the models to move into the future, which is another way of giving you more confidence that, in fact, we are um, looking at a drying trend in the southwest, and in the title of their paper, they said it's an imminent transition to a more arid climate, and they described that more arid climate as being um, something like persistent La Nina conditions in the southwest, which is what tends to bring us dry and warm conditions. This more recent study by Park Williams and others looked at climate effects on forests, and here, too, they used... Um, uh, existing data and model data to look at temperature and precipitation. Those two are in the middle of the two middle panels of the graphs on the right-hand side. And what we see there is that the forecast for temperature is to increase. The forecast for precipitation is to remain relatively stable. But even if precipitation were to remain stable under conditions of increasing temperature, you have drier conditions, and they represent that as vapor pressure deficit, which is shown in the upper graph, in the upper right. So <clears throat> this reflects the uh, vapor pressure deficit is related to the ability of plants to grow under dry conditions. They synthesized this information into what they called a forest drought stress index. This is the lowest graph uh, on the lower right. And they um, have a, a zero line there, which works the same as the anomaly line we looked at earlier. If it's around zero, that means it's the same as the historical conditions. But then in this lowest, gra lowest graph on the lowest ri lower right panel, panel D, you notice that as we go into the future, there's a line that starts to drop, and it passes below a horizontal line that's uh, marked in brown. And what that horizontal line marks is they used tree ring records that go back many centuries across the southwest. And the tree ring records, of course, record how trees responded to droughts in the past, um, dry and hot conditions. And what they are suggesting with the horizontal line in this lower graph is that that's about a approximately the historical limit 
over the past four or five centuries of how much drought stress there has been on tree growth across the Southwest, and that that the uh, essentially average tree would have to face those kinds of conditions uh, on a regular basis around 2030 or 2040. So very difficult conditions for trees to grow. This, the graphic shown here is by the same set of authors, Park Williams and others. This just came out last month. And what they tried to do here was put the 2011 fire season, which is when the Wallow Fire burned and other very large, severe fires in the southwest, in context of what future climate may look like. So in this graphic, the, of the four traces that are going across the graph, the bottom line, which is a dashed line in gray, is showing you the historic trend in vapor pressure deficit, peaking in June and July and then dropping it back into the fall. So we have this humped shape. Then the line marked 2011 with the open circles is showing how much stronger the vapor pressure deficit was in 2011 when the wall of fire burned. Then the with the circles marked in orange, they show what will be projected for vapor pressure deficit in the 2050s, in the decade of the 2050s. And you see that what for us was an extraordinary aberration in 2011 becomes the average condition by the 2050s. And if a similar event, a 2011 type event, were to happen in the 2050s, that's what makes up the top line of this graph shown in red, um, we see a, a really extreme vapor pressure deficit. And in a separate paper that they also published last year, um, this same group pointed out that uh, vapor pressure deficit calculations that they've used in their research correlate very well with area burned in southwestern forests. So that's a pretty dismal overview of what climate looks like for the future in the southwest, its relationship to trees, and its relationship to fires. There are management activities that are aimed at reducing the risk of severe wildfire in dry forests that were naturally adapted to frequent surface fire regimes. And these treatments involve thinning of dense young trees and reintroduction of fire through prescribed burning. So the graphic shown here, on the upper pictures, there's a before and after scene from the same forest area. This is close to Flagstaff, Arizona where a number of large trees have been retained and many, many small trees that were in the background of the original photo in 2003 were thinned. Um, the basis for carrying out these activities includes um, numerous studies using tree rings, using historical records to look at what past forest conditions were like and what past fire regimes were like. And the dense growth of young trees that has occurred since fire exclusion now supports severe burning because the trees make a dense canopy that the canopy itself can burn, and the small trees are lower to the ground, and so they create fuel ladders that allow the fires to spread from the surface up into the canopies of the mature trees. So if you look at the picture on the right, in this case after treatment, you see that the, the fuel ladder is mostly gone. The large trees that were characteristic of the way that this forest evolved are still present, and there's still um, uh, sufficient young trees and new regeneration to allow for future growth. The picture on the bottom is showing prescribed burning on the Apache Sikris National Forest in eastern Arizona. And in that picture, in sort of the middle, a little bit to the right, you can see individual trees that are being thinned by fire in this case. And as many people know, uh, listening to this presentation, but um, sometimes the, the public isn't aware of just what a fire-resistant species ponderosa pine is. So despite the, the rather large flames that you see in this picture, even in that group of trees, there are going to be many that will survive. And the tree in the middle that has fire running up the side of its trunk is certainly um, very unlikely to be harmed by that fire. There is a, a vast amount of evidence from observational studies, from experimental studies across the western United States that treatments like these 
are very effective at changing fire behavior, at um, resisting the, uh, the capability, uh, the vulnerability of these forests to burn with stand replacing intensity, with high severity. The picture shown here is from a somewhat larger landscape where you can see um, in the background a larger treated area and in the foreground a more dense untreated area across one of the places this is in far northwestern Arizona on the Arizona Strip where one of the first of these types of projects was put into place as a large-scale ecosystem restoration project. But the the question that is quite relevant for us in light of the trends that we see in terms of climate is to ask whether these kinds of forest treatments still make sense. Treatments like this are underway in many places. For instance, you're seeing here the website from the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project. This is a, a very unique project in the Southwest where Flagstaff voters approved a bond to fund activities of thinning and burning in areas very important to watersheds around this city. In the Santa Fe watershed, one also sees a high priority place on trying to carry out treatments in order to prevent severe fires and the very damaging floods that occur afterwards. But our question is how to incorporate uh, climate change into these analyses. So we return to the Rodeo Chetiscai fire that we started at in the beginning and that fire burned over sites that had been treated as well as sites that had not been treated prior to the fire. And working together with staff from the Forest Service, uh, the, the National Forest and the Rocky Mountain Research Station, we selected sites on the Rodeo Chetiscai fire that were treated and untreated measured these originally in 2004 and remeasured them in 2011. The original assessment, the original measurement in 2004 went into the analysis done by Barbara Strom where we used the forest vegetation simulator to project 100 years into the future and found that the treatments had a very persistent effect um, and a very positive effect in terms of conservation of the original type of vegetation. But the questions now were, how do these sites change over time? How does climate affect change in terms of the different climate scenarios and the different management scenarios for the future? And are there persistent legacies of treatment or not? In other words, do treatments really make a difference? So in order to do this, we used a model called the Climate Forest Vegetation Simulator. The Forest Vegetation Simulator, or FVS, without the word climate at the front, is the most widely used such model in the United States. It was um, developed by researchers in many different places. It actually is not a single model, or at least originally was not. It was integrated together in a shell based on variants that were used in different parts of the country. And it continues to be supported by the Forest Service with research and with training and is a, a extremely useful management tool. The forest vegetation simulator was modified by Crookston and Rayfelt in a study that they published in 2010 based on analysis of climate forest relationships from forest inventory and analysis data. The forest inventory and analysis program has plots on forested land all across the United States on public and private land. And it's an extraordinary data set for looking at um, any kind of question related to the, the forest of the United States, but in this case, particularly the relationship of climate characteristics and forest growth. The modification, the climate forest vegetation simulator, calculates a species viability score, which is related to the climatic effects on individual species, and that score is used to adjust growth, mortality, and regeneration. So we took our um, situation on the Rodeo Chetiscai fire, our existing plots and remeasurements, and took the opportunity to revisit these post-wildfire projections using climate FVS to look at persistent effects of treatments. 
The empirical analysis of plant climate relationships was published by Ray Felt, Crookston, and others in 2006. And they looked at many different species. The example that you see is the, the dominant species in our sites, which is Ponderosa pine. And so you see range maps under current and future conditions, um, indicating in this case uh, reduction of Ponderosa pine almost everywhere, perhaps some expan expansion in places that currently have less Ponderosa, such as Nevada or parts of Idaho and Oregon. And if you look particularly at the Southwest, Arizona and New Mexico, you see a substantial reduction in the extent of Ponderosa pine over the course of the 21st century. These kinds of predictions come from fitting, from determining bioclimatic envelopes using presence absence data from the FIA plots, the forest inventory and analysis plots, modeling their relationship to current climate, and then under various um, future climate scenarios, looking to see where suitable conditions occur. And the graphic on the right-hand side of the screen here shows an example of the existing um, distribution of ponderosa pine, which is the dark polygons uh, drawn across the western U.S. And then the yellowish and greenish colors are showing the diminution, the reduction of that range of ponderosa pine under a future climate scenario. The advantages of using this kind of modeling, which is, is commonly done for trying to anticipate the effects of climate change, are that you have huge data sets and highly precise models of very strong relationships between the presence or absence of different species and climatic variables of temperature and precipitation. There are many well-known disadvantages to this approach. Um, Obviously, for a species to live in a certain place, it needs to have suitable climatic conditions, but many other factors are important as well. So if a species is predicted to have a suitable habitat in some place where it doesn't currently grow, it would have to get there in some way, whether naturally or through human assistance. And then factors such as disturbance, like fire or insect outbreak, are going to affect the way that, um, that vegetation and ecosystems can persist. Um, in addition to whether or not climate is suitable. Within Climate FES, a species viability score is created by evaluating the suitability of the site for each species under future climate. And then these viability scores are used to adjust the existing FES models of growth and mortality. So if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, you see a, a diagram of a species viability score where essentially in the higher values of the viability score, there is predicted to be a full probability of survival. Um, the species should be able to persist and grow just as it has in the past. Within the FES model, this essentially means that the original model, which worked on empirical data about tree growth under competition, under density-dependent competition surrounding it in a stand, um, is going to grow just the way that it had in the past. Conversely, on the left-hand side of that graphic, as the species viability score drops to zero, that means that the tree is not going to, the species is not going to be able to persist under the modeled conditions. So it would not reestablish, its growth rate would slow, and its mortality rate would increase. And then in between the two extremes of zero and one, there's simply a ramp that allows the growth and mortality to be reduced. The species viability scores in an innovative feature of climate FES can also be used to auto-establish new regeneration, including from species that are not currently present on the site. And so this is a, a potentially useful part of this tool where one can look at a suite of species that may not be presently found in the study area, but which could potentially be viable in the future and under this um, auto establishment routine of climate FES can be brought into the model. And we've done studies using that auto establishment feature as well as field regeneration data measured in the study areas. So I, I just wanted to pause for a second and, and double check with Amy and others to make sure that everything is going all right or see if anyone has a 
a, an issue that they would like to bring up at this point. I think we're good. Sound quality is good and the slides are advancing. All right. Okay, good. So now we're into the modeling methods and we'll show the results and then open it up for a general discussion. So within the, the Climate FES framework, um, being as the, that this has been developed as a management tool with a substantial amount of support from the Forest Service, there's a website called Climate FES Ready Data where one can get site-specific files and develop different climatic scenarios. The climatic scenarios that we used are shown here. So we have a no climate change or NCC scenario. And then we used uh, three different general circulation models and four different socioeconomic scenarios. Now in the, in the most recent assessment report by the IPCC, the socioeconomic scenarios that were used in the past to guide modeling have been replaced by a framework called representative concentration pathways. But it, the, the, the more recent version actually makes a little more intuitive sense. But either way, what they're suggesting is a range of different um, social responses to climate change, asking whether the world is going to continue to put out greenhouse gases at the same rate that it has in the past, or whether there might be reductions um, in the future. And those trajectories give you future climate changes that range from more relatively moderate, a few degrees Celsius, to severe, say uh, three, four, five degrees Celsius by the end of this century as a global average. We also developed scenarios of management to test in the model, and these were based on interviews with managers and with the literature. The scenarios that we chose included no treatment, tree thinning from below, and then applying prescribed fire at different intervals. A five-year interval, which is something close to the natural fire interval that um, existed on these sites before about 120 years ago, or longer intervals of 10 or 20 years. The graphic shown here is showing the diameter distributions on average of the stands that were treated and untreated prior to the Rodeo Chetiskai fire. So the stands that were not treated before the Rodeo Chetiskai fire, shown in the left-hand graphic, before the Rodeo Chetiskai fire, all the bars would have been completely black. In other words, these were living trees there's a diameter distribution that is strongly skewed towards the smallest diameter trees, the 10, 20, 30 centimeter diameter categories. This is typical of many untreated forests across the southwest, across the interior west. The, gra the graphic today, though, after the, after the Rodeo Chetis Sky Fire, has both white and black bars, and the white parts are trees that were killed in that fire. So if you look at the untreated graphic, you see the forest used to be very dense with small trees. After the fire, it's a very open forest with quite few trees, and those are mostly in the 20 to 30 centimeter diameter range. On the right-hand side, the same kind of graphic, but what it shows here is for the forests that were thinned before the Rodeo Chetiskai fire burned. Those forests had much fewer trees per acre and proportionally much fewer. They're still dominated by small trees, but proportionally uh, much less disproportionate dominance. And after the fire, many more trees survived in that thin forest than in the unthinned forest. And that's why the bars have much more black on the treated side and much less white. So this is our starting point, and these are the the treatment comparisons that we're looking to see if they persist in the future under scenarios of climate and management. Here are a few scenes of the landscape in the remeasurement phase nine years after the fire. Um, one interesting question that we don't have time to get into in this webinar, but that is important across the Southwest, is the degree of regeneration after stand replacing fires. And there are some places where regeneration has been virtually nil, uh, including around Flagstaff in kind of the western part of the Southwest, where we've had some places that have burned and had no regeneration whatsoever. In contrast, in other places where sprouting species exist, in the top picture shown here, the juniper species is alligator juniper, which is a sprouting juniper. Not all junipers sprout, but this one does. Junipers and oaks give very strong regeneration responses. And then the pine seedling in the right-hand lower picture 
um, shows what's happening on a large part of the Rodeo Chetiscai area, which is a place where ponderosa pine regeneration is, in fact, pretty um, vigorous right now. So this slide shows the results of the modeling exercise over a period of 100 years in terms of the two most important species, ponderosa pine and gamble oak. In each graphic, what we're showing on the y-axis is basal area, and this is in metric units here. Um, for some of us in the audience, it's more customary to use English units, and we would multiply by about five. So we're looking at about 50 square meters, excuse me, square feet per acre, where it says 10 square meters per hectare, and going up to about 150 basal area at the end of the simulation. And what we see in each of these simulations is eight lines. There's one solid line in each one, and that solid line is when there's no climate change. And then there are several combinations of dashed lines, and all of those are the different climate change scenarios. Now, you might recall we tested several different climate models. That's because um, different climate modeling groups use different approaches. There was no real difference between climate models. There were huge differences between scenarios. And all the scenarios identified here as severe climate change, where you see the basal area increasing for a little bit and then dropping back off close to zero, are the scenario called A2, which is the more severe business as usual type of social scenario where the world continues to put out greenhouse gases. And then the um, group of lines indicated as moderate climate change are scenarios of less greenhouse gas production. Now, if we look at ponderosa pine on the top graph, we see that ponderosa at this site does best, uh, grows best after the Rodeo Chetiscai fire for the next 100 years under a no climate change scenario, the way that we have been looking at it up until now. Under moderate climate change, there are four scenarios, but all of them still have ponderosa pine at the end of the 100 years, but less, uh, some cases almost 50% less. And then when we look at the severe climate change group, we see that the, the ponderosa falls out of the forest entirely. Now, if we look at Gamble Oak down on the bottom, we get a somewhat different answer. The solid line, again, is no climate change. And we do see um, good growth predicted for Gamble Oak under this scenario. But there's actually some potential improvement under some of the moderate climate change scenarios. And if we, I don't have the graphics in here, but if we were to look at Juniper and Pinon, then we would see also that under moderate climate change at this approximately 7,000 foot elevation in eastern Arizona, some species will do better in a species mix, which leads to one of our uh, our first two conclusions here, species respond differently. So the vegetation changes that we see today, some of which have been vegetation communities that have been associated for a very long time, maybe since the last ice age, are likely to change differentially. And in some cases, that will be to the detriment of currently dominant species, and in other cases, to potentially to their advantage, at least under moderate climate change scenarios. What we see under the more severe climate change scenarios, however, is complete loss of the ponderosa pine and gamble oak, which are currently the two dominant species in this type of forest. This is consistent with the type of results that we were looking at earlier from Park Williams. Now, when we turn to the effects of management treatments over time, one of the, one of the negative uh, implications of testing lots of different scenarios and different treatments and so on is that you get uh, an exponential amount of results. So I just want to focus on a few things that are highlighted on this graphic that's stretching across no climate change, a severe and a moderate type of scenario. And so what we see here over a period of 100 years, again we're looking at basal area, is a representation of what's predicted to happen with no climate change comparing the treated, the places that had been thinned, and the untreated, the unthinned stands over time. And what we see here is that the, the thin stands start out with more basal area. That's because more trees survived the fire. Over time, the trees grow. It's strongly dominated by ponderosa pine, and that keeps it in the keeps it similar to 
the forest that was on this site before. When we look at the untreated site, we start from a lower starting point because more trees were killed. At the end of 100 years, we have a more mixed forest, but still substantial um, component, maybe about 40% basal area by ponderosa pine. Let me pause because uh, someone raised their hand, but I don't know if they can write a question in the chat box. Sorry, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, who who raised their hand? <laughs> Can you see who it was? Uh, it flashed on the screen and then it went away. Okay. Uh, I apologize to the crowd. I'm not used to this. No, that's okay. They probably way. lowered it. It might have been an accident. So ah, okay. if, if you did have a question, please hold it a few more minutes and we'll, we'll get to that point uh, soon. Okay. So to summarize, with no climate change, we return to dense forest. And there's a persistent treatment effect of this original thinning and not thinning. Now, this is exactly the same as a result we got in 2007, because at that time we did not um, include any kind of climate change in our modeling. We also looked at what would happen if we added a treatment of prescribed fire and restored the historical fire regime about every five years. Well, the horizontal lines that you see in the graphs here are indicating that the forest is very stable. It's quite open. It has a low basal area. It's dominated by pine, which is the most fire-resistant species. And we have an open pine forest or even a savanna. This is entirely consistent with the forest restoration approaches that have been undertaken in the southwest and that are going on today, which suggests that if we restore the structure of the historical forest by thinning out young trees, reintroduce fire, and allow that fire to burn quite frequently as it did in the past, that we'll have a conservation of the ecosystem type, similar to the conditions that existed before we came in with fire suppression, with logging, and so on to change the forest. However, the projects that have been undertaken to date have not focus too much on the implications of climate change. I have to say that every year as new project plans come out, more and more they discuss climate change, but usually in relatively qualitative terms. So what we wanted to do was take a look at these, these specific set of treatments quantitatively using the climate FES model. So here we add, um, we look at that same prescribed fire treatment under uh, moderate climate change scenario. And when we burn every five years, which is restoring the historical fire regime, what happened was a long-term decline in the forest. And the reason in the modeling scenario is that the species viability score of Ponderosa is declining over time. And so mortality, the likelihood of mortality goes up. And every fire is accompanied by some probability of mortality. So we lose the stability of the system. But in this particular example, if we go to a longer fire interval of 20 years, then the model suggests that the forest could be stable or gradually um, increase in biomass over time. I don't want to focus on that result because we don't know, we don't have a great feel for how accurate that one snapshot response is. But the most important point is that moderate climate change leads to a modification of the proposed management regime. When we look at the severe climate change scenarios, then all scenarios led to the elimination of pine forest. In the case of using prescribed fire, we had complete forest loss because the non-pine species were not resistant to the fire either. When we had non-burning treatments, we result in an oak or juniper savanna. These are species that can grow under the dry conditions but are not very resistant to fire. And in this case, the current fuel treatments do not have a persistent effect. So the overall conclusion from the severe climate change scenarios is that it leads to a completely different ecosystem and management regime. In terms of carbon stocks, if we look after 100 years of simulation with no climate change using the approach that we would have used even a few years ago to project the effects of of treatments and management um, strategies, we would see a high carbon stock, but still a persistent pre-wildfire treatment effect. That's the difference between the green and the yellow bars on this graph after 100 years. If we look at the carbon implications of 
the moderate climate change scenario, we see an average 21% decline, about a fifth in, car in carbon stock. We still see a persistent effective treatment. We still see a difference between the two bars. And under the severe climate change scenarios, we see a 94% decline in carbon stocks and a treatment effect that pretty much disappears. Now, having the model suggests that forest would disappear from these sites under severe climate change doesn't mean there's no vegetation. There is alternative vegetation that would come into the site, but this is mostly grasses and shrubs. So it would represent a substantial lowering of carbon stocks over the long term. So to summarize from this particular exercise using the, the climate FES model to project the changes after the Rodeo Chetiskai fire. Um, it's obvious that models of climate and of forests are uncertain. Um, the forest model that we used is a great forest model. It's very precise in terms of tree growth and biomass and so on, but all that precision was developed empirically under past climate conditions. So the model of the forest is uncertain. The models of future climate change, as we see in the results, are even much more uncertain, largely driven by the uncertainty about how the world will be producing greenhouse gases over the 21st century. But the potential magnitude of change is extremely high, so the fact that it's uncertain doesn't mean that we should not think about it. We saw species responding individually, so forest composition will change. We saw that even moderate climate change suggests a reassessment of management. And the specific example that we looked at here was that even though we know that the historical fire frequency was, was very high, um, that restoring that exact same fire frequency might pose a problem in future forests that are more vulnerable to mortality. And then uh, severe climate change scenarios completely altered the native forest ecosystem. So the future effects of current fuel treatments are positive to neutral, depending on climate outcomes and future management regimes. But one thing that I neglected to point out, I meant to earlier, when we looked at the graphs showing how Ponderosa and Gamble Oak grow over the next 100 years, the, difference, the differences were striking at the end of the 100 years, but all the trajectories were very close together over the next few decades. So it is not clear today which trajectory we might be on. Um, even with more severe climate change, we might have several decades before we can see a difference. Current management policy requires assessment of future scenarios. So managers produce um, environmental assessments <coughs> um, and impact statements, but it doesn't mandate consideration of climate change effects. And it is challenging to try to incorporate climate change effects, but it seems like a direction that we should be moving towards. And in the specific case of forest management, climate FES is suitable for the data that we have and for the training that is available. So uh, we should use it. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Just want to say thank you to the people and organizations mentioned here and the publications that came from this work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foulet. Um, there's a lot of great information here, and I really appreciate you orienting it towards how uh, managers might start to think about using this information and these methodologies um, in their decision making. And, and I expect we'll have some additional questions about that and other things. So folks, we're going to call on people who've raised their hands or who are raising their hands. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself to be able to ask your question. And then when you're done asking your question, please press star six again to place yourself on mute um, so we minimize any background noise for our recording. And I do have a question in the chat box, but I don't know if everyone can see that. It's from John Taylor. Um, why don't you um, go Let ahead. me answer his question, and then, yes. and then others can, can chime in. Okay, and I've got one so, in the queue as well, So, but let's start okay. with that. All right. So John asked, do the climate models take into account changes in precipitation or just temperature? They do. In, in this particular analysis, they do both. How well does it play out over an elevational gradient? Um, I would say for in this particular setting of climate FES, when you have forests over that gradient, it works very well. This model includes some capability to model non-forested landscapes, but 
um, it's designed for forests. So if you're looking at a mountain range with an elevational gradient like the Sangre de Cristos, the Sacramento Mountains, the San Francisco Peaks, then that's exactly what it was designed for. And his last question is a great one. Would you suggest revisiting the basis of the model in future years as knowledge of climate change improves? Yes. And of course, the thing that by focusing on one example, um, neglecting to talk about the wide variety of other models many of which are more suitable for research use than for management use that are available for looking at forest changes. But basically, this is a, a field where it's growing, it's changing, people are testing their results and trying to learn more as they go on. Um, Jerry Rayfelt and Nick Crookston, who developed Climate FES, recently published an analysis where they were able to show um, over a pretty short term with an aspen forest that their model predictions were proving to be pretty correct in, with about a decade's worth of aspen measurements in the field. So we definitely want to do that. Okay, thank you. And Amy, you mentioned um, having another. Yeah, we had um, the hand that was raised earlier, I think, was um, Jürgen Hoth. So Jürgen, if you can press star six, um, if you still have a question. Are you there, Jürgen? Okay, I'm going to unmute everyone. Um, and, and then we'll see how that goes. <laughs> the conference is now in talk mode. All right, uh, Jurgen, are you still there and do you still have a question? All right, we may, ha we may have lost him. Um, I do have another question in the chat. Um, so, folks, if you could um, go ahead and mute yourselves if you're not planning to ask a question here. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> so I do have a question in the chat. Is there a way for managers to access these data in an easily digested way? To access the results of this modeling study or to do... Um, to access all of the climate FES tools. I'll, I'll answer both of those. So the, okay. our results are available in the publications that are on the screen right now. And if anyone is interested in more detail, if you're actually planning to um, incorporate climate FES and analysis that you're doing, we'd be happy to talk with you about that or share more information, as would the Service Center for FES. Um, in terms of whether a person can start their own project, that's where there's so much support and help for FES that makes it a really useful tool right now um, for trying to look at this range of possible future outcomes. So by simply Googling Forest Vegetation Simulator, uh, one can learn a lot about it. And within the different federal agencies, there are often people with a lot of experience using this model. They usually don't have much experience with using the climate part of it, but that's exactly where by knowing the model well to begin with, you can easily learn to add this additional component. There's also a message in the chat box from Randy Fuller, and he said the Council on Environmental Quality issued guidance yesterday saying that the climate should be considered in any natural resource management NEPA. He said it's not law, but guidance. Right. I think this kind of information is very timely for all of us, um, and that just definitely validates that, emphasizes that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're we're getting some background information or noise now, so I'm going to um, put it back on, on mute. Um, Peter, press star six to unmute yourself, okay? Okay. The conference is now in silent mode. All right, Peter, are you there? Yeah. Okay, so do you see any other hands raised? Um, you can scroll up and down that participants list. Um, sorry for my technological backwardness. Well, that's okay. No, just, uh, just Jurgen's hand was raised, and okay. uh, I guess he didn't have a question. So um, if anyone else has a question, if you could um, open up the participants list, if you haven't already, 
At the bottom of that, there's a little hand that says raise hand, and you can click on that to um, let us know, let Dr. Foulet know that you have a question. Or you can also um, write it in the chat box um, to Dr. Foulet or myself or to um, the whole group. You're seeing any hands there? Okay, so yes, um, there's a message in the, excuse me, not hands, but there's a message in the chat. Okay. Let me answer that and then there's a hand. So the Great. first message in the chat um, is from Elizabeth Harbaugh and she said, the example you provided about management was focused on controlled burns. Can you speak to results on forest thinning and how that may affect forest survival under climate change? And the, the overall analysis did um, talk about, did, did address thinning as well, future thinning. And the nice thing about the FES model, as many of the people listening here know, now that I'm looking through the participant list, is that it's, it provides a lot of detail and control for all sorts of different forest management actions. That's what it was developed for. And so one can look at all those kinds of attributes. To answer her question specifically, thinning definitely helps. Um, it reduces the vulnerability of the forest to severe fire, and severe fires can also be modeled in this system as well, but we didn't do that in this case. Then there's a hand raised by Dagmar Llewellyn. So Dagmar, press star six to unmute yourself. And then go ahead and ask your question. Hello, um, this is Dagmar. I just, I just want to be clear. Um, so w about where we are in these trajectories of moderate and severe. Do is it recommended to do the treatments today in the in southwestern Ponderosa forests for preservation over the next couple of decades of the forest and prevention of the real severity of wildfires? I mean, we have climate change going on already. I don't know if you consider it if you consider that as in your no climate change scenario or your moderate climate change scenario or where we are on that. Uh-huh. Specifically the way that the the climate FES model was set up, to the year 1990, the climate related to the year 1990 is considered as the baseline for no climate change. So you're correct. I mean, we're already 15 years of substantial warming past that. Um, the One way to answer your original question is to think, well, would our forest be vulnerable to severe change even if climate weren't changing? And the answer to that across much of the Southwest, the overwhelming answer from many, many research studies is yes. Just because of the fuel conditions that we've talked about and the interruption to natural fire regimes and natural processes in the forest. So carrying out treatments, even had climate change not occurred, would be a logical and important step to undertake. But when we look ahead to the future and think about severe climate change, um, it is possible that the vegetation types that we have now are not going to be living at the same elevational range in 50, 60, or 70 years, which is not that far in the future. You know, if you just think about your kids, and it's it's not that far away. Um, but that's what that's what these modeling results and also the other research that I was showing at the beginning show. So, how do you define severe climate change? In this case, we're looking at additional temperature increases that are say more than about five degrees Fahrenheit or about two, a little bit more than two Celsius. Okay, okay, and that would be, in that case, the forest loss would, complete forest loss under a severe change would be? You know, there's a lot of discussion and speculation about how climate change might play out and it's gonna be fascinating for all of us who, who get to live that long and experience 2050 and 2060 and so on, but um, to, I said we're not predicting the future here. I'm just trying to understand where yeah. we're going. So when you look across the elevational range of a whole species, it's likely that at the current upper end that there would still be a, a high probability of, of survival of that species there, but at the current lower end, probably a complete loss, things like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tagmar. 
And um, I think we're out of time now. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Foule, for this great presentation. We've had a, a really nice turnout today in terms of numbers of people, obviously a lot of people interested in the work that you're doing. Um, I want to thank all the participants for making time to be with us today. Dr. Foule did provide his contact information, his email, which was included in the invitation you would have received either through MailChimp or a Google Calendar invite from the Desert LCC. So if you still have questions for him, you could contact him via his email. Um, and as I said, we hope to post this on our YouTube channel. You can search for Desert LCC YouTube and you'll find that right away. We've got lots of webinars there and this one will be up soon. So thanks Terrific. everyone Thank very you. much. And anyone who, there's a couple of questions in the chat box. If anyone's interested in talking further, please send me an email, pete.foule at nau.edu. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to all of everyone. you. Have a great Take day. Take care.